was definitely Monica Manuel. <laughs> <laughs> it was She's Maria the weirdest, and I She's feel like that was George as well. Oh, his name's Mina, maybe. I think his name's Mina. Yeah. Mina, the guy that plays guitar. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, spot on. Spot on. You hit the nail on the head. It was definitely Monica Manos. as well. So we just hit it on the head. It was uh, yeah. Maria, Monica, Spot on. Spot on. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Are we back? Are we good? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a bit of an echo. So guys, without without Yanni, uh, we didn't we didn't say hi. <laughs> <laughs> um the guys as 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 we started last week we're going through a series it's a new series it's exciting all right can anyone can anyone remember actually anyone that's not on mute can we can you tell me what series we're going through or take yourself off mute and tell me what you're doing. anyone catholic epistles Catholic epistles. Very good. Excellent. Catholic epistles. And last week we did the epistle of St. Jude. Okay. This week we agreed to start a new epistle. Okay. Um, I won't tell you which epistle. I'll let the speaker introduce it. Okay. We're very, very lucky and we're very blessed to have Mary uh, with us speaking. So let's all concentrate. Let's all take out our Bibles and our, and our notepads and our Bible highlighters and our pens. Okay. And, and let's focus together. Mary, please. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So, thank you, Kiro. Um, I think without introduction, um, we, uh, here in the WhatsApp group, you would be aware that um, we've, we're going to start in um, amazing, some of the most amazing, I think, Catholic epistles written by um, St. John. So I say Catholic epistles, that means he's done more than one. Can anyone tell me, just show fingers, how many epistles St. John has written? Yeah. <laughs> Wrong, Bish. <laughs> Kira, that's right. So he's written three. Oh, I thought um you got it right. yes, but there are seven catholic epistles that's right um so has saint john written any other books in the bible yes no yes okay good um this is going to be a struggle actually like feel free to unmute yourself guys <laughs> um uh, yeah, so he's written the gospel, uh, like that's that's an obvious one. But what else has he written? So he's written five books. So he said he's written three epistles. He's written the gospel, Saint John. What what other book has he written? Okay, I have to check the chat. It's like too much multitasking. Okay, so Revelations, great. Thank you so much, Mon. Okay, so he's written the the gospel, and um, the three epistles, and Revelation. Right. Um, so what, how do we know, what gives it away a lot in the epistles that St. John has written that he is the writer is just the amount of reference he makes to his, to the gospel that he wrote. Um, and the, a lot of the times when he writes, his focus is solely on us, the believers, that we need to believe that Christ is the Messiah, okay? He is the Messiah and he has come to give us eternal life. That is St. John's main focus in all of his epistles. That, guys, you need to remember Christ is the Messiah and he's come to give us eternal life. And that, and he makes a lot of reference in both his, in the, in the gospel of St. John and in the epistles that, that, Christ is the Messiah. It's all about Christ, the Messiah, that he's going to come. He's going to give us eternal life. Um, in the epistle, any epistle that St. John has, uh, has written, we'll find that he talks to 
like he talks to an audience that he assumes already know um, Christ, that already have read, read his um, the, the gospel. So he's so the audience is actually the believers. It's not to a foreign nation or people that don't know Christ or um, a, you know a church that's still being built. It's it's to the believers who already are aware of of Christ. Okay. Um, so we find in the epistle that he, Saint John doesn't mention his name. You know how um, previously, um, when we read the letters of Saint Paul, or even last week when we um, read the Catholic epistle of Jude, um, the writer introduces himself. Usually, says, "You know, Jude, your, Jude, bond servant of Christ." Right? But Saint John doesn't mention his name. He goes straight. He goes straight into it. Okay. Um, and he doesn't, sorry, what was that, Irini? Okay, not sure what that means. I'm sorry, um, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, so St. John doesn't mention his name, and he doesn't start with an introduction. He doesn't, like, say, you know, I'm writing this to St. Uh, to a particular person, to um, Timothy, or, or, or he doesn't write it to a particular nation, like the Corinthians. Um, he doesn't write it, he doesn't address it to anyone. And the reason for that is the epistle comes in a style that's more casual. It's like a letter, right? Like it's when, when um, a father speaks to his children, right? So you don't go and say, when you, get, when you enter the, the house, you know, you don't go and address your children or you address your father and mother and say, hello, this is me, I am Mary, like, um, you know, I'm writing, I'm, I'm addressing you today and like, it's not a speech to a particular audience. It's a casual conversation between father and his child. And, and St. John uses the word, lit, my little children, very often in, in his epistles, okay? which is actually a very nice sort of comforting way um, of addressing, um, addressing us that we know that we have a pa like a pastoral sort of father interceding on our behalf and um, he's, he's wanting the best for us. Okay, so that, that's his, his approach in his epistles. Um, the place where he wrote this epistle is, um, is known to be Ephesus. So it's... Um, Asia Minor, so where Turkey is currently. And the time that he's written the epistle is towards the end of the first century. So it's around, I think, 93 AD. is after the destruction of the temple. And the Jewish nation had ended completely. All right. So in his epistles, he doesn't mention at all um, the persecution of Christians or anything like that. You won't hear anything about um, the Christians being persecuted. That all ended a long time ago. But what um, he addresses, because what happens is when Christians don't get persecuted, they have a lot of time and uh, to think, right? And when you have a lot of time to think and you have time to yourself, uh, unfortunately, this is time that you might spend in the wrong way and so a lot at, at that time there's a lot of heresies so we find that when the church doesn't go through persecution you find that her heresies grow the number of heresies grow and um and the church gets fought by a lot of heretics so um saint john in his epistles mentions a couple of um mentions uh, addresses one of the main heresies of the time which is the heresy of knowledge, right? So the group of people, the group of heretics were known as the agnostics. You, you guys may have heard of them because they still currently, um, there are still agnostics around. Um, and the heresy is basically against the person of the Lord Jesus, all right? So what the agnostics believe is that there is a good God right? And that good God only creates the spirit, okay? And then the bad God, the evil God, creates all material things, okay? So how can God, who's all good, take flesh, be materialistic, right? And therefore become evil? That they think, they thought that couldn't at all be possible. 
So instead, they, they were claiming that Christ was not a real body, all right? He was just appearing to be hungry. He was pretending to be hungry. He was pretending to be thirsty. He was like pretending to be crucified. Like the, the, the body of Christ was not real. That's what, that's what they um, claimed. But the early church confirmed that the flesh, that the flesh is, is actually good. Whatever God creates is good. It's not the flesh that's bad. The flesh is good, but we, us men, women, we defile that good, that good flesh and, and make it evil. All right. So God creates good, but we make it evil. And that God did, in fact, you know, come in flesh. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was truly crucified and he died for us. Okay. Um, and that he, that God resembles us in everything except for sin. Okay. So that's what the epistle was trying to address this particular heresy. Um, and the, the group of her heretics at the time, which were the agnostics. Does anyone want to add anything or have any questions at this stage? Okay, so like I mentioned, the purpose of St. John's writing is for us, his little children, to understand that we have eternal life. Okay? Why, why is it important for us to, as Christians to understand that there is eternal life? One is that he wants us to be joyful, to live in hope at all times, okay? And that even if knowledge can change our minds, Christ can change our whole lives. He wants us to know that there is a bigger, bigger thing for us to look forward to. He also wants us that while we're on earth to not sin because that's going to impact our eternal life and to always turn toward him. He wants us to know that we have, we have someone that we can, um, advocate, that can advocate for us, that we can have confidence in him, that if through him and through our fellowship with him, we can gain eternal life. And he also, in this epistle, wants us and, and warns us of deceivers. He wants, to, he wants us to avoid these deceivers, these antichrists. So this is basically a summary of the purpose of the epistle and what St. John wants us to get out of it. So our focus, and remember this focus throughout the epistle as we read um, uh, the, the different chapters through in, in the coming weeks, that the main purpose is how, what, what does eternal life look like and how do we get eternal life? How do we get there? Okay, so let's start reading um, chapter one. I'm gonna need someone to read. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna randomly pick um, someone, one of the girls from Parthena's camera. <laughs> <laughs> Can you read the first verse for us, please? I think we're the easiest targets. Mary, is it the first verse? Yeah. Okay. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of the life, word of life. Okay, great. So um you can really tell that this is St. John, can't you? Because the first verse, the first introduction is so, so similar to the Gospel of John and how the introduction of the Gospel, he talks about the Word of God, the Logos, okay? Um, and it's really important at this point to say that um, what he mentions that the logos and that he was from the beginning okay so why is why do you think this is important is it because he you know so he's talking to believers right but why is it important 
that he is mentioning that this word word of life is from the beginning why can someone just tell me why do you think this might be important to us Is it because he's just highlighting how it's like um, like God? Because that's what they believed about God. He was existent from the beginning. Yeah. So um, thank you, Tina. Yeah. Um. Yes. So I think I think it's like taking us back to basics, right? I think sometimes we take for granted that um the word of life, the Trinity, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit was there from the beginning of life. He's saying it's not like, you know, God just decided to create his son and like send him out to us. No, no, all three of them were there right from the beginning. And so he wants people to remember that it was at the fullness of time that 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 God, the, the, that God, the word, the Logos, came in the flesh and became man for us okay so he is the the they are all one and he was there from the beginning it wasn't like he came later on and god was different from the start okay and there's proof of that in the old testament and i'm sure you guys know some examples so i'm going to need you to give me some examples there's one example that's very clear right from the from the start from the book of Genesis, when um, the, the 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 book that Saint Moses writes uh, refers to God as in a plural plural sense. So he says, you know, we the God as refers us to to more than one person, and he talks about the spirit of God. In, um, in the start when, when he was creating the world. But can someone think of another time where in, in the Old Testament, we can see the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? The Epiphany? Yes, yeah, so that was in the New Testament arena. Oh, yeah. that's, that's, that, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So in the Epiphany, when um, God the Father was speaking and the Son was there and the Holy Spirit was the dove. Yep. Yeah. But any examples from the Old Testament as well? If, if I give you the example, can you tell me what is the God the Father and the Holy Spirit? So the burning bush. So the burning bush, so God was speaking to Moses and the fire was there as well. So we, we can consider that like the Holy Spirit. So the God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit were manifesting themselves in several ways. All right. right. I've got an example. I don't think, I don't know if it's the Trinity, but um, Moses did mention in the beginning was the word being the son and the word was with God and the word was God. Yes. Yeah, correct. Okay. So I, I suppose it's really important for us to remember the, the proof of the Trinity and to remember that and to understand that it was right from the start. It wasn't just when Christ came to and, and manifested himself to us. Okay. The, all three of them were there right from the beginning. And this was really important to address so when, in, in St. John, when he was saying, I have, with our, which our eyes have seen, have looked upon, and our hands have, have handled concerning the word of life. It was important for St. John to say that because the heretics were saying, oh, like he could, he, you know, this God could be like a, it was just a pretend body. So it was important for God, for St. John to say, no, no, I've, I've seen him, I've handled him, I have like looked at his eyes, I have spoken to him, I have lived with him. 
So no, this is the true God and he manifested himself, right? Um, and this is the word of life. So we were, why is, why is the word of life used here? It's, it's because he wants to emphasize that we were under the sentence of death and he came to, gave, to give us this life, right? So God came and manifested himself because we were under the sentence of death and he came to give us life. Let's read the second verse and see how this life was manifested. Um, Andrew Armanias. Yes. Go. Verse two. The life that was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So the life which was manifested. So we, we only got life and it was only possible because it was manifested to us. It came to us through Christ. Okay. So the word of life. So the so our we got life. We were in, we were sentenced in to death, but we got life through the manifestation of Christ. Okay. And here we say Saint John says bearing witness. So it shows that Saint John is fulfilling the role of the apostles that Christ had given them to bear witness. And we as, as um, witnesses, we, we as Christians need to also bear witness. And how can we, how can we bear witness? And I think sometimes we overcomplicate it and we think, oh, you know, we need to bear witness by saying to everyone that um, Christ, Christ came and manifested us. Is that, is, that, is that what we mean by bearing witness? like having arguments with agnostics and making sure that they understand <laughs> that um, Christ is the Lord? Is that, is that how we bear witness? Or is there different simple ways of bearing witness in our daily lives? And I think, um, I think when, when I think about this, I think of bearing witness between me and me and God. Do I sit down every day and keep a diary? Or like, do I think about how did God manifest and give life to me today? Do we do that? Do we sit down and say, God, I, can, I, I, I saw you man, manifest yourself in front of me today when you helped me do X, Y, and Z. I saw you give life to me when I was at my lowest. I saw you give life to me when I had trouble talking to that person, I saw you, I, I bore witness of you. And I think when you write that all down each day, I think over time, you, your faith in him grows and strengthens because you bear witness, you're bearing witness of his existence in your life. You're bearing witness of him giving you that life. Um, and I think we take that for granted. And when we do keep that diary, you'll find that when you reach your lowest, when it's your darkest moment, when you open that diary, it actually comes in handy because you remember all of the manifestation of God in your life. So I think that's one way we can bear witness that I think we don't, we, we can do more often. Another way of um, bearing witness is by praying and opening the Bible with our own family unit. We don't have to go far, and I know we can't go far, um, but within your own home, do you, op do you open the Bible? Do you pray together? Do you go back home and tell your family how God has manifested himself to you? Do you have that chat across the dinner table? Do you say, oh, you know, mom and dad, do you know what happened to me today? God was so good to me. He did this, this, and that. The fact that you can actually even say that to your closest, sometimes we don't even do that, but the fact that you can do that, that is bearing witness to him. And I think 
And I think we, we, can, we can do that in so many ways, but it, come, it becomes more effective when you're praying together as a family unit, because all, all, of, the, all of your focus is on him. And so you're, you're starting to remember all the love and manif the manifested love that he's given you throughout the day. The another way that you can bear witness is by being a joyful person and having hope in him and doing good in the same way that he's manifested good in your life, he's manifested light in your life, sharing that manifestation with others, right? Sharing him with others. And, and I think that's, that's what this, this chapter is about. And we'll, we'll, we'll look into it more about how, how St. John wants us to share, okay? Um, let me pick, this is a fun game. Irene, you're looking bored, wake up. Verse three, please. I'm not bored, Mary Lou. <laughs> that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ again so saint john really wants to hone in on this message right that that which we have seen and heard we declare to you and again, I just want to say, he, I think he keeps harping on about it because at the time, I, I, like, I, like I've mentioned before, it was around 93 AD, like it was after, um, it was after the temple had been destructed, destroyed. Um, and so around this time, if you think about it, he must have been like one of the only people around that have seen Christ. Everyone around would have, like, everyone that had seen Christ may have, at that point, died. Because St. John, as you remember, had, had lived many, many years, right? And so he's sitting there talking to people that have never seen him. And so he's having to always mention that, by the way, guys, I've seen him, I've heard him, he's real. Don't believe those heretics that say that he's, pretend, he's a pretend flesh. No, no, I saw, I saw him, okay? So that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. Okay, you, Mary, Irene, Steen, you may have fellowship with us. Who's us? It's the church. And so it's not you have fellowship with God, right? You have fellowship with us. And so it, he talks here about the importance of fellowship being a collective thing. It's not an individualistic thing. You know, if it was an individualistic thing, then this whole social distancing would be okay. Like we could just be praying by ourselves at home. Abuna wouldn't have to bother like preparing all these services online. We wouldn't all have to like, you know, continue services online. We would just be relying on us and our own struggle to, to pray at home, okay? What St. John is telling us is it's pretty much impossible to live as a Christian alone in this world. You, you required, you, are, you need each other to live through this world, okay? We need each other. We need each other to maintain this fellowship in Christ so that we can live through hardships in the world. Don't ever take that for granted that we have each other. Um, and truly our, and so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. So it's not like it's just us as a group, but again, this fellowship is with the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. It is with the Trinity, but through this fellowship, we are able to be one. Through this fellowship, we all become children of God. Okay? Uh, why do we need this fellowship? And this is what, what the next verse will tell us. Why do we need this fellowship? Fanus. Mm. 
Wakey, wakey, Panos. Good question. Um, book. Yep. Verse four, Panos. Sorry? Verse four. Wait, you want me to read the verse? Okay. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Okay. So why are we talking about fellowship? Because St. John says, my little children, I want you to know that through this fellowship, you will get eternal life. In this eternal life, you're not going to be like those people who are going to be scared of dying because after death, you'll have eternal life. And so your, jo your joy may be full. Okay. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. You can be happy. We can be happy temporarily in this world. We can be joyful temporarily in this world. But the, your joy will not be full unless you understand that there is eternal life and that to get to this eternal life, you have to have fellowship with him. Okay? So one, have fellowship with him and with each other so that you may attain eternal life. And once you have this belief, your joy is full. Okay? Now, how do we maintain this fellowship? So how do we make sure that we get to our destination, eternal life? How do we maintain this fellowship? Verse 5. Monica Ramsey. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Okay. Thanks, Monica. This is, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, okay? God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There is not one speck of darkness, right? It is like this kind of light that is so shiny, this like clear light like the sun where you know you can't even look at it because it's it's just too it's too bright right it's the kind it's not just physical light it's spiritual light it's moral light it's the kind of light that when you see you're just paralyzed do you remember someone that saw this light and was completely paralyzed and blind anyone so yes so so Saul was was on his horse in this path of darkness, right? Absolute, full of path of physical darkness, but also, you know, spiritual and, and, and soulful darkness. He was in a mission of killing and persecuting the Christians. And God's light shone on him. His light of truth sh was shining on him and it blinded him. He couldn't even comprehend it because he was so full of darkness, right? It's the kind of light that made him stop and stay put for three days and just like not, not be able to do anything until, until he could reassess, review all of his thoughts, review the kind of darkness that he was living in, right? And I think sometimes we, we look at um, our isolation or our lack of activity as a bad thing. But sometimes I think, you know, there is good to just staying put. It, it's forced us to really see God's light in the small things in life. It's really forced us to have a look about look at what 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 were we doing before i mean you know governments and and businesses are talking about you know we're never going to go back to the same way right because everyone now is like online doing all these um different ways of working but have we stopped and assessed how we were before spiritually and where we are today and what we can learn from this, from this stillness. Have, have we also experienced God's light in our lives in 
in daily things so like do we do we look at do we look at small things differently because we've got now more time at our hands in our hands so use this time use this time of stillness to consider god's light so again this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So light equals fellowship with him. Darkness is when you lose his lose this fellowship, right? And I mean, we experience this throughout our lives. We go, we have our ups and downs, we're human, okay? So does this mean that if I lose my fellowship with him, if I walk in darkness, that's it for me? I will not have eternal life. I will not, my joy will not be complete. Is that, is that what's going to happen? No, there is hope. Okay. Um, but before we talk about that hope, let's have a look at what someone might think of his fellowship with Christ and if it's true or not. Okay. So Maria Mikhail, verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, perfect. So this is, um, I don't know, like, I think it's, it's, I've, I tried thinking about this and what kind of people, you know, claim to have fellowship with Jesus, or with Christ, and, but they're actually walking in darkness, right? I want someone to go to Ephesians chapter 5, um, verse 5 to 16. Ephesians chapter 5, Anyone got there yet? Tina, you're smiling. Go. <laughs> um, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the, through, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See, that, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Re Sorry. Okay. So I, I suppose this um, extract it sort of explains the contrast between worldly darkness and Christian light. Okay, and so don't come and tell me that, you know, you've got fellowship with Christ when you're not following him in the Christian light. Don't come and say, I'm worthy of communion. I'm worthy because I've got fellowship in, in, with Christ. Don't come and tell me that you're the best Christian and you're full of righteousness when you're, you're falling in, the, in darkness. You're doing all of these things that uh, were listed in Ephesians. There's a, there's a clear contrast between worldly darkness and Christian light, okay? So don't, don't claim that you're righteous. Don't come and say that I don't need um, the light, like I'm fine, you know, um, that I, I, I am walking in light. I don't, I'm not walking in darkness because then what, what God is calling you, what St. John is saying in his epistle is that you're a liar, okay? So... If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, okay? Which is like normal if you think about it. Like if, you, if you're saying that, 
if you're saying one thing, but deep inside, inside of you is darkness, then lying is, is, dark, is darkness. The truth is light. So you would, you're obviously not walking in the truth, okay? Um, next verse. Um, Mina Benjamin. Mina Benjamin. Okay, verse seven. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm currently not at my computer, so I can't actually see the words. Oh, okay, no worries. Sorry. Me. Sammy. Verse seven. Look in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Great. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. So he's saying, don't worry. You know, if it, like if, if you feel like you, you're lying to yourself or you, you're deceiving yourself by saying that you're righteous, you're righteous um, and that you are walking in the light, um, but in fact you're in darkness, don't worry. You can walk in the light only because he's in the light, only if you have fellowship with him. Um, and you have fellowship with one another. And actually, really, Again, it's, it's, it's quite important what St. John is saying about fellowship and each other. Um, this re-emphasizes our responsibility as Christians that we need to look after one another, right? So it's, it's, it's not enough that you're walking in light and you're happy and you're in fellowship with Christ. You need to make sure people around you are walking in the same light with you. Okay, so he, he is putting some responsibility on us that we need to be a collective community and have um, and, and make sure that we, we're, we're in fellowship with him. Um, and we only can do this by walking in the light with, within the light, which is by following God's commandments, by reading his word, by talking to him. Um, And, um, and if we repent, so he's basically saying, if, if we repent, we can maintain this fellowship. We repent and have communion, which, which he refers to here as the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So he's saying the way to have fellowship with him is to walk with him, to be guided by his commandments, to repent and to have communion and, and be re redeemed by him through his blood, okay? So the blood of Jesus Christ, which clean, cleanses us from all our sin. And he says here, all our sin, which is such a comforting feeling. The fact that if you go and repent and confess your sins, all of your sins, God just forget, forgets it. You're, you've got a clean slate with him. You can start all over again, okay? All right, verse eight. Mm. I'm running out of people. Um, Andrew Manias, did you read? Verse eight. can't hear you. Okay. Do you want me to read? Sure. Um, 
if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay. And this is another type, I think, of um, liars that St. John is saying. So the first liar is basically saying, I'm righteous, I'm all good. Um, I don't actually fall in darkness. You know, this kind of liar here is people who, who claim they haven't sinned because they've redefined sin. Okay. They're saying there's, there's, what are you talking about? There is no such sin that you're talking about. They've redefined it. So um, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So those are the ones who are just completely in denial. Um, and they ignore the truth and the truth of, of their own weakness. Okay. And they can't, they can't see the light that's around them. All right. So and I think if you don't, if you're not able to, to understand the sinful nature that you're in, then you're falling in this vicious cycle of not being able to see the light, not wanting to have fellowship with the light, not having fellowship with others who are in the light. And so you're constantly, you know, deceiving yourself and, and, and falling in this, in this hole of darkness. Okay. And, this is what St. John is trying to sort of prevent us from, from, from doing. And so he's identifying those people that can fall in this darkness. And if you are in this, please remember that no one is sinless, right? We're all, we've all got sins. We all need Christ and we all need to be in fellowship with him. So how do we do that? Again, he talks in verse 9. Um Someone, Bishoy Abdenur. Verse nine. If we, so yep, um, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, He talks about confession. So He says, guys, we need to man up. We need to admit that we're wrong. We need to take full responsibility for our wrong. We, with no excuses, we need to go to Abuna and not make excuses for our wrong. You know, we need to be quite honest with ourselves and say, right, I did X, Y, and Z. That was completely me. You know, I take full responsibility of that and be completely bare in front of God and say, God, I actually need you. I, I need your grace. I need you to come within me and, and fill me with your light. All right. And he is faithful. He's faithful. And he said he will clean us completely. Right? He says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, the word all. It's not just like what you mentioned. Like he will completely forgive you all your sins. If you yourself can be bare completely and say, right, I am completely wrong. I take full responsibility for this. Um. And I think we'll do the last verse and I just want to um, conclude with a, a story or more of a parable, really. Um, so, Monica Sawiris, last verse, lucky last. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, are you okay? No, okay. Um, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and and finally, not only are we liars if we think that you know we're we we're without sin, but we make him a liar because he said not one person in this world lives one day. Yes, I hope Monica's okay and does not have coronavirus. <laughs> um, are you okay, Marina? We're all worried about you. <laughs> okay, so if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, so we completely are disconnected, basically, is what St. John's saying. And he, we, we can't have at all this um this fellowship with him all right 
So, and we make him a liar, which means that like, if we make him a liar, then therefore we, we are disconnected. We can't be heirs, we can't be his children and we can't have eternal life, all right? So I'm gonna quickly summarize this chapter. Um, the word of life came to us to give us life, right? That's how it starts. Word of life came to us to give us life. How? Through fellowship. And how do we get this fellowship? We believe in him. And when you have this eternal life, your joy is complete, right? But you should know that God is light. And if you walk in darkness, you will lose this fellowship, right? So when you do have eternal life, and when you do have fellowship, you'll get eternal life and your joy is complete. But you should know that God is light. And if you walk in darkness, you will lose this fellowship. So how do you keep this fellowship? You man up. You take responsibility for your wrong. You repent. You confess. You have communion and regain this fellowship and have eternal life. And then your joy is complete. Um, I wanted to share with you a final story, which I think really resonated with me. And it's kind of like a parable. It's a little bit shallow, but I feel, I hope that you guys benefit from it as much as I, I did. The, this person or the speaker um, compared our situation to a beggar. Okay, so a beggar on the street, he is, um, you know, doing different kinds of like, you know, music or juggling or whatever to, to, get, to get money, right, to make ends meet. So he's begging, begging, begging to get money and he gets like $2, $3, $4 a day, okay? And he's got this huge debt, right? So like he really needs like a savior. He needs someone to come and just sort of give him like bucket loads of money to get to his debt. But no, no, he refuses. So he'll just stay on the street begging, all right? Then comes one day, this rich guy is so generous, right? And he feels sorry for this guy and tells him, right, you know what? I'm going to give you my own credit card, right? Here's my credit card. You keep it with you. Every time you have a debt, you just use my credit card, right? You go and get some cash out, use the credit card and, and aish, right? Like live your life and, and do whatever you want, right? So the guy is like, great, this is a great sort of thing. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep this credit card. What does the guy do? Next day, he still goes out on the street, keeps the credit card and continues begging. He's just begging all day, every day. And I think what the, the speaker was trying to say is that we have God, who's Christ, who came and saved us. And he's given us his blood, right, his credit card. And we can use this on a daily basis when we repent, when we confess, when we have fellowship, when we, when we talk to him, when we read the Bible. We can use this every time we're in debt, when we're in, when we're in sin. And yet we don't want to use it. We just keep it in our pockets and instead rely on our own self. We rely on our own selves and we're just sitting there begging and using our own efforts to, to go through this life and to gain happiness and to gain joy. When our joy can, can be complete by using God's grace, by having fellowship with him and by continuing this, this to be in his light and basking in his light. And so... I think we really always need to remember that we are nothing without God and that we are full of sin. We are beggars. And when we actually understand and recognize that and that we have this, this advocate right, right there telling us, please talk to me, please, please use me, please, you know, bask in my light, please, um, Confess your sins and, and, and be aware of your darkness so that I can shine my light on you. I'll, sh I'll do the rest. You just, you just do the first step. Use the credit card. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Any questions, comments?
Thank you. A question. Sorry. Um, about verse 10, where he says, like, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, and I, like when he says him, like God, a liar, like how, how, how are we making God a liar if I say that I have not sinned? Anyone wants to make a comment? So I think in, in, the, in the Bible, in Job, I think it is, um, it's quite clear that no man that lives one day um, that, that is, it is like lives without a sin, okay? Um, so we are all born inheriting Adam and Eve's sin. If we say that that's not true, then we're saying that God, you're a liar, and what what Adam and Eve did was okay, like it was fine. Um, but in fact, we inherited that sin, and so I think I think that's I think that's what it how I see it. Anyone else want to comment though? Does that answer the question? I'm not sure if it did. No, you're right. You're right. Christ came to die for our sin. Okay. So as if someone comes to do something for you, just for you, a problem that you're in and you're in denial, you're saying, oh, but I don't have a problem. Christ is saying, you have a problem. I see the problem. He's saying, no, but I'm not, I don't have a problem. Yeah. So Christ is saying, no, you have a problem. And you're saying, no, I don't have a problem. So who's a liar? You're making him a liar. You're saying, no, I'm right. That means who's a liar? Yeah. Thanks, Kira. Any other comments? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have one question. Like, uh, what happens if we don't realize uh, that we are doing a scene? Like, even to repent, we need to know, like, uh, we are, like, doing a scene or not. So sometimes, especially in this time, like in this world at this moment, or currently, like a lot of scenes are like, uh, it seems like it's normal or it's not a scene. So what if uh, we don't realize that if, like we are doing a scene to repentant even? So what happened? What will happen? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, like, I, I look. I think one we need to remember that God is a merciful God. Okay, so and God will look at your heart more than He doesn't like have a checklist, right? And says, right, you didn't do X, Y, and Z. Um, there's a like a checklist of sins that. Um, you need to be aware of or you're not aware of okay he looks at your heart and he knows that you might not be aware of the sin that you're doing so he judges accordingly okay so that's I think one thing that I think we need to take into account the other thing is though is that when you repent and confess a lot of the fathers also repent and confess for things that we, they do knowingly and unknowingly. We even pray that in the Agbeya. Um, and things that we may have um, done that we've forgotten about. And may I, I don't imagine that when we go to confession, we remember all of our sins, right? So even the things that we forget about, I think we, we can ask our confession, Father, even, you know, please forgive me for all the things that I have said and the things that I've forgotten about things that I'm not aware of, please make me aware of it and pray to God that God's light shines on you and you can actually see the sin. God, open my eyes and let me see the sin. Let me address the darkness. And you'll find that through prayer and also through reading his word, you'll get to better understand his commandments and you'll get to better understand what he considers a sin. 
okay so that's why we 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 are doing bible studies you know this is why we go and listen to the word of god in church is because through that we learn what's good and what's bad anyone else want to add something to that not i'm not sure did that answer your question yeah i got the answer that's good thank you I'm just mindful that there's a prayer meeting in five minutes, Kira. Um, does anyone want to add anything, any final comments before we conclude? All right, perfect. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and yeah, I pray we can all live a life like Christ together, you know, in fellowship with each other and with Christ. All right. Um, just before we end, so we can have uh, two and a half minutes of fellowship with each other before the prayer meeting. Um, I just wanted to mention there was a surprise announcement before I forget. All right. We're going to try from now on just to encourage us because it can be hard to listen through a screen to encourage us to listen more. There's going to be a quiz after every book. All right. Each book we complete. So first John, second John, third John. All right. Um, the epistles. After those three epistles, we're going to have a quiz. It's going to be a Kahoot online quiz. We're all going to be there together, okay? And as an incentive, guys, I'm sitting behind this icon for a couple of weeks now. It's not by accident. Now, that's my icon. You're not getting an icon, all right? <laughs> but there's an icon, guys. There's going to be a prize, okay? It's going to be, it's going to be an icon. It's a good one. Sound you like <laughs> But I promise, I promise at the end of every quiz, of every book, the, the winner of the Kahoot will get an icon, not this icon, an even better icon, okay? Um, so as, as an incentive. So from now on, let's really pay attention because all the answers to the questions in the quiz are going to come from the Bible studies themselves, okay? Um, so we'll, we'll say a quick prayer and then we'll have two and a half minutes of uh, fellowship and then we'll go to the prayer meeting together. Um, Bishoy, can you pray for us, please? Tadjus. I'm not sure Abdul Nur is there, but it's a uh, How do we get someone else to pray? Yo, have a Bishoy Abdul Nur. I like the idea. The name. Name, huh? Yeah. No, Khalas, in the check like his name. Wait, who? Andrew. Oh, Bob. Oh, yeah, Andrew. Come on, please. Can you pray for us? Yeah, Andrew. <coughs> We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can all be here and be in fellowship with each other. Lord, I ask that you bless each person that is attended tonight. Allow us all to remember how important it is to be in fellowship with one another and that it is your will to always be with each other and to be with you first and foremost. Lord, teach us to love you more and more each day. Teach us to love each other more and more each day. And stay with us to the kingdom come. Here it is as we pray, thankfully, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.